All right, well, call that good. I put before you a challenge. Create a file, and then create a folder, and then put that file into that folder. Let's say that you've been working on a file, and you've been saving changes to that file, and then when you're done working on that file for the time being, you save your final changes to that file. And then when you come back and work again, you open that file, and then you save that file as with a new version name. And then when you're done working on that file, you save it again, and you close the program, and you go home. What I'm pointing out here is what the typical user of a computer does on a regular basis all around the world, hundreds of millions of people. But we, who know more about computers, we use content versioning systems for our coding, do we not? We use the original CSV, we use Subversion, we use Mercurial. These are great programs to manage repositories of source code, sure. But what do people do when they're just writing a document, when they're just tracking the hours that they worked? That's the question that I'm asking. A rhetorical question, to be sure, since this is a lecture and not a, what do they call that, um, words of a feather talk. But think about it. If you're just going to sit down and edit a file, how do you know when you started versus when you ended working on it? In the most commonly used Linux file system, ext4, we do have, in theory, a date created timestamp in the metadata of the file system, as well as a date modified timestamp. But when you're looking at file system explorers, do you actually see that? In Thoronar for XFCE, there's only a date modified and a date access column. Same thing in Conqueror or now Dolphin for KDE. So how do people go about keeping track of when they started working on a particular version of a file unless they go the lengths of setting up an entire content versioning system repository? That is my thesis here today, that there is no way to do that. And there are a few operating systems in it with a few file systems that allow you to do this, but I have not found a single way to do it in Linux using an open source Libre file system. Even today, I am stuck using NTFS with Linux because it's the only file system available to me that is operable with Linux at a good speed as both read and write. It has those drivers bundled with every distribution of Linux that I encounter. I could almost use HFS plus, except that that distribution, that is to say, that file system coming with any given distribution is not going to have write capability in the drivers. I'm stuck using a proprietary file system simply because of the date created timestamp in ext4 not being accessible. And so I've been studying this for years, trying to find a solution. Recently, someone in one of the uh, internet relay chat groups for one of the projects out there, I think it may have been Linux Med itself, happened to have been reading a manual file regarding a particular command line command known as find. And I thought, Eureka, here we have found it. But no, take a look at this. Let me get the correct parameters here. The media crew had to set me up with a different laptop.
arbitrary, meaningless one that it shows them. Yeah, let's actually look at the manual file for find. Hmm, I'll pull it out of my bash history here. The born again shell. Is that big enough to read? I can make it bigger if need be. Let's see. Okay. Bigger would be good. Yep. There we go. Now I'll have to make the font a little bit smaller, though. All right, there it is. So I am displaying the output of the find command for the contents of the current directory with date created, date modified, and date accessed timestamps for each file, demonstrating that there actually is that set of fixed metadata within the ext4 file system. The problem that I'm encountering is that whenever you look at this closely, you'll find that the date created continues to be updated to the date modified regardless of what you do. So here's a file that was probably created earlier than when it was modified, as physics tends to require, but here the date created is set after the date modified. This is the problem that I've encountered with even operating systems that have file systems that are set up to have the date created timestamp function in this way. They tend to have the date created timestamp function as a date copy created timestamp. There's no separate field 
for date created and the date that this copy was created. So the original file's timestamp for creation was not preserved. This occurs most famously in Windows Explorer, for anyone who actually has needed to look into this. I have found that I'm still stuck using Windows more often than not to deal with my NTFS volumes and its own utility known as RoboCopy, which is the only thing I've found for the most part in the entire sphere of these kinds of programs that is capable of producing a true directory tree copy. The only other example that I've found is the um, Finder file system explorer in macOS. And yet, so with macOS, you can only create these kinds of exact copies using the graphical interface of Finder, and its terminal programs fail to provide that option. And with Windows, it's the reverse. The graphical interface of Windows Explorer only allows you to set the date created timestamp to the current system time when copying. Moving, it's fine, but copying, the new copy receives the date created timestamp as though it were the original, even though it's just a copy. So, am I wrong? I hope I'm wrong. But that's, that's the question I put to you today. Is that do we have a way in Linux of creating a true directory structure copy? I mean, I put that question to the audience. If anyone has any thoughts, feel free to speak up. <laughs> it's probably not something that we have to deal with when dealing with code repositories, because every time there's a commit, you're creating a timestamp in not the file system, but the actual content version system. So you copy that tree to a different drive, and you don't care, because all that important metadata is contained in the repository that you've copied. The file system is not doing all the work. I don't think file systems were ever designed to do the level of metadata maintenance that I'm talking about here today. That's what concerns me, is that the focus that we who have a, a technical mind for this sort of material, we've given the focus over to having the file system do very little of the work. We focused entirely on having the content version system do the work. But to the customer, to the average user, how many people actually think about installing and managing a content versioning system? It's just not baked in. People are using the file system as a content versioning system. That's what I see in my residential customer base, and I suspect <laughs> you would see it in any corporate environment as well that doesn't have a dedicated IT department for content versioning. And even then, how successful are they at training their employees to use a content versioning system? That is the, my question. I guess, thank you for listening. That's, that's pretty much the presentation. I could go into a lot more detail about different things, but I want to hear questions, definitely. I, I'm, I'm still a little clear on, unclear on what date you want. Do you want the new creation date, or do you, I mean, like the copy with a minus A, or there's a lot of options, we'll, we'll preserve will preserve the date time copies when you do a copy command. Of course, when you do a modification, well, you have any modification date. Sure. So um, when, yeah, you're saying when, whenever you make a copy using the copy command with the, the A parameter, you get a copy that has the original date, create, date modified timestamp. But how would you even go about viewing the date created timestamp in Linux? With, it's kind of like, contrast versus brightness on my monitor. You change the contrast to make it brighter, and then I don't understand why. But on this one, when, when you change the file, is it the same file as it was before? So the modified date is kind of like the created date, and then the created date is just the date that it was written did. The idea that the date created and the date modified are pretty much the same thing, I think that has to be the thought that's been going through the heads of developers for decades in the Linux environment. But you'll notice that other operating systems, even uh, BOS and, and now Haiku, they have a column for date created and a column for date modified in their file system explorer. So, well, of so course, hmm? in, in practice, if you're writing a program to uh, modify a file, typically, if that's going to take any time at all, you're going to create a copy in a temp file and and then you're going to get a new creation date because you're actually not working on a true modified file. 
you're working on the temp file because you don't want anybody to screw that thing up during the work period. Yeah, you're, you're and just. And I assume, I mean, I assume I'm not the only one that would write it that way. I assume everybody writes that way. Well, from a technical perspective, I think you're giving a good point there is that you're saying, if I understand correctly, that you, you don't want, because it, because it basically a, a separate file is being written every time that you save something in a, in a well-designed program, and then that copy is being overwritten against the original copy. Yes. Yeah, so that, that's a good data, secur well, data security in terms of corruption potential. It's a good idea so that you don't accidentally destroy the original file before the, the new copy is finished. But that's, that's between us. Like, we know yeah. what we're talking about. So how do we develop that in a way that the common user can take advantage of without having to install a content versioning system? Yeah. Um, I, I think that you're correct in that, in that you really have to define what it is that you want to retain. And it's true, the user doesn't care about whether that's implemented at the file system level, OS level, or application level. Yeah. And a lot of office programs assume, okay, the application has to deal with this. Like Word documents, when they're mm -hmm. saved, have a lot of metadata stored in the document, not on the file system, yeah. about creation time and so forth. That's infuriating when you are doing forensics work, because you can't tell if that has been modified. <laughs> you just know that the, the application says that that's what it's created. But that's very helpful for an end user, not a forensic. Exactly. This this presentation is entirely from an end user point of view. I can see how that would confound forensics. It would confound yeah. everything right. that we we think about. But just a creation time doesn't give a user much in the way of content version. All they know is even if they had a really accurate creation time, it's just oh, I started it on Tuesday. I, I can't go. Well, it's it's terrible, obviously, <laughs> from, any, from the point of view of anyone who uses an actual kind of inverting system. So I wonder but, if that's why it doesn't show, because nobody cares. Yeah, well, I, I care. I, on, on Windows, I, I use Windows Explorer uh, because I was able to add my own fields. <laughs> like I opened a Visual Studio editor thing, and in like 15 minutes, I had a, a truncated version, because the company I was working for insisted that the file names be ordered in a stupid way. So I did a little quick operation and then got the way I wanted to sort it. And I could sort it in Explorer on my own custom field. Uh, it only took me like a half hour to do. And I'm adding 15 minutes every time I say it. But uh, yeah, it, it was quick and easy. And then I could have date created, date modified, date access, this, this stuff. Because we were creating a lot of files and if I saw a glitch between file created times, I knew somebody had stopped or the machine had jammed or something. So it was enough information for me to like dig into that area. But well, the date times created and date times modified really are not terribly useful in a file system because if somebody's like backing up the file system, if they do it properly, all those dates are preserved. But leaving out one A flag or whatnot, everything's screwed up. Well, I, I wouldn't call them state robust. They're not robust. And what graphical user interface do we have that handles the A flag that you're talking about? Yeah, like if you were, <laughs> see, that, that's the problem. I, I, this is like the inverse of preaching to the choir <laughs> because <laughs> because we don't need to use the graphical interface. <laughs> so how do? But but how about the average person out there? Yeah. So you you just you just want an option in in Dolphin or or whatever yeah. to please show the create date. Yes. And that sounds totally reasonable, although I'd be scared of it because it's a lie. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, it's a really good point. It, but <laughs> the, the, the responses I'm getting here today are, are, I'm experiencing them as reinforcing my point, actually, because to the, to the non-technical user, that, that, that lie, that, that reality behind the curtain that 
a copy is being made and then the original is being overwritten, that is, is supposed to be invisible to the user, to the user of any desktop environment. And so, I mean, it's not like I'm going to start a new open source project talking to you here today, but it's just food for thought. It's like, has anybody really addressed this? As it's a serious usability issue in my experience for non-technical users. What, what do, they, do they miss? Well, um, I'm not sure if I can get, since I don't have my slides, I can at least draw on the board. My point is that the average user thinks of it like this. They create a file and it, they, they created it at a particular point in time. And so they keep working on that file and then they save it at another particular point in time. Date modified, date created. You have two timestamps per file. That gives us a span of time in which those are like your billable hours essentially. <coughs> and so then when the person comes back to work and opens the file again to continue modifying it, they open it up, no timestamp, but touch because they've brought it in RAM, it's not even changed on the file system. And then they, so that's like, like uh, file zero, for example, the first version. And then they, they open it again, the second time that they come in, they open it, they save it as, from their point of view, that's just one new copy being created, as version one, say. And so that created timestamp, this created timestamp time, represents their second session of work. And then they save that when they're done, presumably saving it throughout. They don't really care because they're not managing a repository. They don't really care about all the intermediate saves. But that final date modified timestamp for their second session represents a different span of billable hours. That people do this all the time in the world in my experience. Does that make any more sense? It does to me, and it sounds to me like what you want is a database or, or even get back file system with a beautiful UI yeah. that <laughs> abstracts out. <laughs> Easier said than done, right? Yeah, it abstracts out which? And that's, that abstracts out, so they're, they're not gonna use it in a, in a like what we think of as a good Git manner. Yes. They're gonna keep making copies. Yes. The yeah. UI is going to extract out, oh, they made a copy then and it looks like it actually came from there, therefore. Mm -hmm. and, and if you could force them to, I mean, it's reasonable like I did with my F underscore zero, F underscore one file names here. It's not unheard of for people to actually use a naming convention. <laughs> they do yeah. make mistakes quite frequently and humans are, humans are inconsistent creatures, but people do tend to use naming conventions, like having even a date in the file name. Like, I know people who deal with putting the file, putting the date created in every single file name in their entire file system, which... I do that. Yeah. I, yeah, I, do I, I do that a lot. And that kills the concept of being able to sort by name. No. No, no. if you do it right. Actually, not, not, not if you know the file from here. <laughs> well, I just used that, but who knows that other than people like us in this room? <laughs> you, you have year, month, day. There you go. Yeah, but what if... <laughs> what it if, sorts really nice. Like, there are the names separate from the... So let's say I... <laughs> this is so totally the inverse of Priest of the Choir. Um, let's say I put, you know, year, month, day, even hour, minute, second, probably don't need nanoseconds, <laughs> into the file name. I've lost the ability to sort by name, unless I design some script to ignore the first several tokens of the file name and then no, sort. No, you do it the other way around. Yeah. You still want to sort by name. But though, mmm, interesting. I'm, interesting. I'm on with your get back file system with a yeah. beautiful UI. Start the project. I'll <laughs> well, thank that's you. That's a great idea. See, that's part of why I came all the way here from New Hampshire, was to, to inspire myself to get this thing started by at least giving this public talk about it. I gave a similar talk two years ago to a non-technical audience and they had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> so that's <laughs> because even from their point of view, they didn't care about the date modified, I mean the date created timestamps because they just, they weren't even, they weren't even doing the billable hours kind of thing. But, yeah, no, I, I love your suggestion about putting the timestamp after the file name in the file name in order to continue to sort by name. But that wrecks the UI because 
you have variable lengths of file names. So they, they're no longer aligned into a column. Right, that's like, why I wrote the thing in my Windows Explorer. I love that. that. Handled, I gotta get your code. <laughs> it, it handled the last whatever characters and then made it be its own column. That's brilliant. I'd love to see that. But it's still, um, like, also, you, you've had to physically type, unless you had, like, a, unless you set up some utility to say, like, control semicolon. I used to do that to insert the, date, the timestamp into any text field. The scanning program it automatically had the time field. It, so when we were done right. scanning, every time it scanned, it created. And this is something else that would have been in my slides, which is that there are various file formats and programs that deal with these kinds of timestamps, like, um, the XIF tags for JPEG files from cameras or even RAW files, I guess those have them anyway. All of that in the data stream metadata is, is really nice, but many file formats are defined without those specifications. So it falls to the file system to track this information for the average user. And also, not only do you have file systems doing too much of the work, you have, with these file types, that have the metadata encoded in them, that kills your ability to do checksums on the, the main data stream. Because if I tag my photos, you know, typical activity for millions of people, if I write notes about my photos, if I give them a five-star rating, or a rating on a five-star scale, all of those changes to the metadata are in the primary data stream and are gonna change the checksum of the JPEG component of the picture file. So that's, <laughs> that's another, go ahead. Yeah. You do see applications, or and certainly I, I use things where my file names get to be exotic because I'm putting a lot of stuff into the file name field. Exactly. You've got what two? Is it 256 characters in here? Oh, that's a good goal. That's good. Anyway, it's yep. it's a stream full of characters. Yep. It's longer than a tweet. Sure. Um, yeah. And, and I think more than you, you can encode a lot of information in there if you need to, as well as a little bit in the beginning to give you a, a, a mnemonic idea of what's actually in the file. I, I deal with people who do that. And um, it's not backward compatible with FAT32, for example, to put, it on a, to put it on an SD card to go print a picture, that kind of thing. That, of course, is true, mm -hmm. except you make a tar file on the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> good, good luck getting a, 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 a photo printing kiosk to, to, to okay. decompress that. <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm basically... You, you <laughs> yeah. want a lot. Hmm? You, want, you want really a lot, like you, you want persistent, reliable create dates, and you want it backwards compatible with FAT32, and you want it to track work time. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. no, no. no, no. <laughs> I'm not asking for backward compatibility with FAT32. I expect to lose this metadata. Except, except, you know, you could do it because FAT32 has a date created timestamp field. If you were to actually, <laughs> if, the, if the copies were being, you basically need touch, but in reverse. Touch gives a file the current system time in its date modified timestamp and perhaps other fields that I haven't checked. And you can lie with touch. You can tell it to give it a different stamp. Right, so it should be pretty easy to build this using touch. And then you want, uh, what did they call that? I think there was actually a FAT32 where they have parallel streams. Ah, it was in NTFS and uh, EXT, excuse me, um, NTFS and HFS and possibly HFS Plus may have been the first. But yeah, they're totally um, alternate data streams. That was gonna be in my slides also, is that they're also called resource forks. Yeah, I see you shuddering out there. And <laughs> my hmm? what's that? You talking about old Mac stuff? It's Reason. still current in their minds, <laughs> but it's also available in NTFS. Um, yeah, it's it's scary, but you know, given that's what's out there on millions of computers, I've often thought about developing this concept in a way where I could take advantage of resource forks to store this kind of metadata. But that would be kind of like that. That would be getting kind of ridiculously demanding and complicated to try and create to try and create a program that's backward compatible with NTFS and um, HFS plus simply because it's using these proprietary file systems ability to have alternate data streams. Yes. I've got it. Let's use the Windows thumbnail 
file that's hidden, <laughs> and let's just embed and all that, and then with every file, we just ship one of those with Thumbs. it. Thumbs.db. Yeah, yeah, sidecar files, that's also in my slide, is that's one of the approaches, but that, to me, is what's happening. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I read an article, you know, a number of years ago, if uh, onto that kind of, they had been suggesting, they never built it, but they had been suggesting that one should build a file system where the file name, instead of having file names, you actually have something more like a relational database yes. where you have various fields that the file, like a, a, a metadata that goes with the yeah. file. I love the idea of database file systems, but working with what's on millions of computers today, yeah. it seems to me we're going to have to come up with some kind of way of integrating touch into a graphical file system explorer for Linux in order to take that new copy of the file. I know this kind of wrecks the forensics of it, <laughs> but, but for, I mean, anyone who has this level of control over the computer can still be altering the forensics, I should think. Yeah, forensics is doomed. Yeah. The hopeless. Yeah. So, so I'm not even worried about the forensics. It's actually the data loss that's taking place from, from the non-technical user's point of view. Every time that date created timestamp is destroyed. It's like, it would be like saying, well, I stopped working at this time, but when did I start working? If I don't know, I don't know how long I worked. That's, that's my point. So what, Go ahead. what about audit kind of data? I mean, the kernel had information about this thing opened the file and it closed the file and it wrote the file. Okay. What if there was a separate process that was hooked in and seeing all those reads and writes and your database is actually separate from the file system that, that now knows all about all the edits to the file and now your file viewer can query it when mm -hmm. it wants to know when was the last time it was updated, who was the user, all that information. There's like a huge history of probably way more than the user needs yes. sitting in that data. Yes, the fact that it's way more than the user needs, um, I mean, I like that idea. It could be something that I could work on, mm -hmm. but the key element would be to then be able to export that to other file systems. Just, right, the, it has to just the one follow the file around. Yeah, it has to follow the file around, and it, so that you end up with just a single date created and a single date modified. Because thankfully, somebody was thinking about this or not, <laughs> because nobody thought about it the way we think about it today with Linux. Back in the days of uh, MS DOS and such, when they were creating file allocation table file systems, and when Apple was creating their first HFS file systems, they and BOS had its thing. So they had, they had a date created, they had a date modified. Uh, perhaps they were actually overriding the original file immediately upon saving the new version of the file, which is a precarious practice to be sure. But at least they were ending up with the correct timestamps from the user's point of view. But yeah. I think you're right about touch. That might be the way to go. It'll be an interesting future. <laughs> well, if there aren't any other thoughts, I might let you go at this point, although um, obviously you can free stay in this room, but uh, that's generally what I had to say, is that we just aren't thinking about it. I mean, I can, <laughs> I can continue my rant if anyone's interested, but. <coughs> You know, I'm thinking about it. I was just looking at the Clan 9 OS design docs to see if they uh, encountered this and addressed this issue. It doesn't, doesn't appear to me as if they have. Yeah. Go ahead. So I, I've definitely encountered this, and I always used to think of it as a training issue. Yeah. And so you have brought to me that maybe it is a design issue. Yeah, that well, we, we need to react to how people want to use it yes. instead of telling them, well, this is how it is. Exactly. But it's, it, it makes it a hard question, I think, or a hard problem. Yeah, well, I've, I've been trying. creation time is hard to mm. accurately. Initial yeah. creation, instant experience, they all start with I. <laughs> So, so is it just one more time column that, like, we have the current creation time? Well, as soon as you copy, that's the creation time of the copy. If it 
brought along with it another time template, which was the original space and time. Is that it? Like, is, the pro is your problem solved? Well, from I, I'm, I think I like where you're going with that, but for the non-technical user, what they want, in every case that I've encountered but where they're they- they're wrong. <laughs> 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 and every they're case- They're asking you for stuff that you don't have any, that you, from their point of view, they only want the date created timestamp to change when they save as. That's when they stamped it in their mind. When they say what? When they say, go to say the file menu, save as. They give it a name, they save it. That's a new file that they're creating. Yeah. It's a new creation. That's the only time that the date created timestamp should change from their point of view. That's that's got to stay within the, the file. That's, that's got to be a, like a field embedded in the Word file. It, I mean, it's got to be there. It could be elsewhere, but... Well, very few file formats take that into account. Let's say you were just making a plain text file with, with some text in it, and you wanted to be able to create a copy of that file on a flash drive to take it somewhere. Plain text file very beginning, like say, seven date string. Th think of all the human effort that consumes with millions of people doing that dozens of times a day. Uh, a lot of people have problems kind of like this, and, and sometimes, sometimes it, it does take a lot of effort. I, I can remember working on some mapping projects where you know they wanted the date and date times created not a file of the Mylar original or of the aerial photo from which the yes. stuff comes from. Yeah. And so, you know, that resulted in needing for each file name, we had to have a quite a uh, complex um, um, SQL database to keep all the meta information. Mm -hmm. And there's no way around that. I mean, Requirement, yeah. basically. Yeah. Well, that's what lawyers are doing these days. Is when we run discovery on their stuff, they end up with a pile of what they call natives, which is the yeah. original files, and then extract the text and then generate the images, and then 